very much. When I was an undergraduate, I took a class with one of my close friends on biblical archaeology. The class was an academic study of the earliest Jewish history compared to what the evidence had to show in archaeological excavations. We compared the literature in the Bible to Babylonian examples of a creation story, of a flood story, and we began to see the connections between the two, and we also noted the Babylonian story seemed to be much older. We looked at the evidence for the Exodus to be found in the Sinai Desert, and found there wasn't very much to be found in the Sinai Desert. We looked at the stories of the patriarchs compared to the time in which they supposedly lived, and it didn't seem to match but we looked at the stories of the patriarchs in the time when they were supposedly written historically, and that matched much better. Now, the interesting thing about this experience in the class was that this was all news to my friend, and it was not news to me. Now, he had been just as involved in his reform congregation through high school and beyond as I had been in my humanistic congregation. His rabbi and my rabbi went to the same seminary. They were both educated in Reform Judaism, they may have even had the same professors at Hebrew Union College. So what was the difference? Well, my rabbi, Sherwin Wine, wanted his congregation, his students, young and adults, to know the real history of the Jews, not just the traditional version of events. Where did the Jews really come from? Who really wrote the Torah if it wasn't Moses on Sinai taking dictation? What happens to Jewish history if cultural evolution was always part of the Jewish experience and not only in modern times? And the real history of the Jews is a fascinating story. Their origins emerging from Canaanite culture, the destruction of Jerusalem, its rebuilding and destruction again, the clash between the Maccabees on one side and Hellenized Jews on the other, as much a civil war as a war with the Greeks, the political agendas of the early rabbis as they created the Tanakh, the Hebrew Bible, as they created the Mishnah and the Talmud. The far-flung diasporas created by Jewish participation in medieval mercantile culture between and beyond the abode of Islam and Christendom. The tension and dynamics of the European Enlightenment and Emancipation. The dislocations and disasters and triumphs of the 20th century. You find all of this and more in Sherwin Wine's last book, his magnum opus, A Provocative People, A Secular History of the Jews. Now, Sherwin Wine was raised traditionally at a conservative congregation, actually had been Orthodox and moved to conservative, in the intensely Jewish neighborhoods of Detroit. And he became a reformed rabbi serving in Detroit and in Windsor, Ontario, after being a chaplain in Korea. He completed post-master's degree studies in philosophy at the University of Michigan. But in the, in the end, he found his calling, even though there wasn't anyone on the other end of the phone, it wasn't a supernatural <laughs> calling, he found his uh, place in life in the early 1960s as he founded the Birmingham Temple, which became the first humanistic Jewish congregation in the world. And he became widely known in Metro Detroit as a public lecturer on a whole range of topics, Jewish and general, philosophy, history, world culture, politics, from ancient Greece to 21st century globalization. Now, Rabbi Sherwin Wine took the pursuit of truth very seriously truth in philosophy, truth in science, and truth in the history of his people. What made Wine so infamous to be called the atheist rabbi in a Time magazine article in the 1960s? And what's the philosophy behind a provocative people? Well, there are three steps to this philosophy. The first is that he was willing to say out loud, in English, a basic philosophical conclusion, that we are the only conscious force for good in the universe. There's no benign, uh, benevolent divine personality directing or intervening in history, parting seas, writing Torahs, choosing peoples, rewarding the righteous, punishing the wicked, who knows if you are sleeping, who knows if you're awake, who knows if you've been bad or good. No being that desires praise for itself, that answers prayers or cares what you eat or what you wear. This transforms your understanding of Jewish history because if you realize that, then maybe the Jewish people made the Torah, not the other way around. Maybe Jewish survival is a function of tenacity and endurance and creativity and valuable skills like literacy. The Weizmann Institute had a marvelous slogan that we can steal. The slogan was, miracles happen. They take a lot of work. <laughs> a second step 
is that he was willing to say in Hebrew what he was saying in English. Because there are plenty of people out there who might agree with that conclusion in English, but aren't willing to take the next step. To change traditional practice, to be consistent, to have integrity with those personal <coughs> beliefs. You may recall a dozen years ago, a conservative rabbi named David Wolpe got into a lot of trouble in his congregation on Passover when he said, well, we all know the Exodus didn't really happen the way it's described in the Haggadah and in the Bible. And that was news to his congregation. <laughs> there was shock, there were news stories, there was controversy. And his approach was, well, but that's what the evidence suggests. You see, his problem wasn't that he said it. The problem was that they don't teach it in the Sunday school. The problem was that they still say every time they take out the Torah scroll, Zota Torah Asher Sam Moshe. This is the Torah that Moses placed before the children of Israel. Even though at his training at the Jewish Theological Seminary and at the Reform Seminary and at the Reconstructionist Seminaries, they learned the real history of who wrote the Bible and when, and over time, and many sources, and all of those details that we have made a part of our Sunday school curriculum, our adult education curriculum, our services. You see, this next step is not just to believe the truth, it's to live that truth, to apply that truth to how you celebrate being Jewish, to integrate it into who people become as Jews and as individuals. You don't just teach it to adults in an adult education session with 10 people on the side and then assume you can say that at a Seder and get away with it. It should be in your Seder, it should be in your Sunday school, it should be in your Haggadah. And I'll commend to you, in addition to uh, the Provocative People book, we have copies of Rabbi Schweitzer's The Liberated Haggadah, which my family uses and our congregation uses in Chicago, which incorporates this kind of archaeological mm -hmm. approach. It tells the story as a story, but it also tries to find out what really happened. Let's see what we can do to make it consistent, to make it meaningful. Let's be willing and even eager to embrace new Jewish creativity and culture because it may be even more relevant and inspiring than those words and ideas from 2,500 years ago. And it may be the case, if you're willing to live that consistent lifestyle, that the secularized reality of Jewish life today is a natural outcome of Jewish history, not a disaster. And the third step is we need to find out what really happened to understand who we Jews are today. Think about the rage for genetic testing for family trees. People want to know where their family's from and how back it goes and what were the admixtures and combinations. And then compare the importance of using archaeology to help understand what the Bible claims, whether it's true or false. Can we confirm it or is it not confirmed? As one example, in the Middle Ages, Maimonides' family began in Spain. There was a massive invasion of fundamentalist Muslims named Almohades and they forced people to convert. They put their Quran on the point of a sword and said, you get one or the other. Take the Quran or you get the sword. Now, Maimonides' family lived under that regime for a number of years, then left, moved along North Africa where they had come from and wound up in Egypt. Now, it's very unlikely that they could have done that if they had not, in fact, converted to Islam and then returned to Judaism at some point later when they were in Egypt. Now, that could be why he was so successful as a court physician to the Muslim caliph, caliph in Cairo. And sometimes in his writings in relation to Islam was very bitter in response, but sometimes understanding about how to live as a subject of this monotheistic but different religion. Now, if you take the pious approach that the great sage Maimonides could never have done that, then we won't find the truth. But a secular history of the Jews can provide these kind of insights into Jewish life, past and present. For decades, Sherwin Wine taught classes at the Birmingham Temple he called the real history of the Jews. It combined his tremendous depth of knowledge, his voracious reading in Jewish history, with brilliant personal insight, his inimitable wit. He taught generations what, to the best of his knowledge, really happened. I was one of his students, all the way from Bar Mitzvah class through rabbinical school. And after his tragic death by a car accident in Morocco in 2007, I was a little cautious approaching this book project when it landed on my desk. You know, it takes chutzpah to write a real history of the Jews, or even a survey history of the Jews. It takes even more chutzpah to try and edit someone who's written a history of the Jews in all times and places. In the end, it's been done, it's come out, I've been very gratified at the reception. And I want to share with you some of the strengths of the book, because they are the strengths of Sherman Wine, the teacher. There's an amazing erudition in world history and culture. 
He's able to draw parallels and examples from all over the world. So I'll give you just one example where he compares the Pharisees <coughs> of the first century before the Common Era to the Calvinists of the 1700s and 1800s. They were both contemptuous of the old religious establishment, hostile to the old aristocracy, populist in their insistence in turning lay people into priests, bourgeois in their class resistance and ambitions for power, conformist in their love of surveillance, self-righteous in their dismissal of the opinions of their opponents, fervent in their articulation of judgment day reward and punishment, and ardent in their obedience to their own newly created clergy. Now, I don't know that anyone has ever compared the Calvinists to the Pharisees. But when you see all of those similarities, you begin to see that there is, in fact, something in common with them. What he does is he sets the context in world history for what happens in Jewish life. He goes into a discussion of the variety of Christian sects that emerged in the first few centuries of the Common Era. And he does this to show you that he knows it, but also to realize that this affected Jewish history because which sect they lived under made a difference. Which ethnic group chose that heresy to identify with to differentiate themselves from Rome made a difference for the Jewish experience. Sometimes you feel like there's a tip of an iceberg where it simply began at this uh, knowledge and then extended and extended, extended beyond what you can see. Now, you also find wonderful asides in diverse Jewish cultures, the Jews of India, the Jews of Ethiopia, where they came from, how they developed, even the Karaites that found their way into Lithuania. Who would have guessed there'd be Karaites in Lithuania? But there were. And most importantly, he sees Jewish history not as living in a bubble, but as influenced by the peoples around them. I'll give you one example since it's seasonal. The letters on the dreidel did not begin as Nes Gadol Hayasham, a great miracle happened there. Because we found tops in medieval Germany that had four letters on them in Roman letters in, in German. And those letters are N, G, H, and S. And what they stand for are the rules for the game. Nisht, nothing. Ganze, the whole thing. Halb, half. Or Stellarein. They used to say Schitterein, but you can't get away with that anymore. <laughs> Uh, I mean, to put one in. And so those were the rules for the game. And when they put it into Yiddish, they wrote it in Hebrew letters, which is what Yiddish is written in. And so it was N, G, H, S, Nun, Gimel, He, Shen. And later on, someone came up with this acronym of Neskadol Hayasham, which has evolved in Israel to Neskadol Hayapo. A great miracle was there. But that's how it actually emerged. It was this interaction with the outside world that we forgot about and then pretended it wasn't even there. But the dreidel is a great example of trying to find real history, too, because I remember reading, even growing up, in some uh, outside literature, that uh, some people imagined that the Maccabees, when they were being oppressed for studying Torah, would be playing the dreidel as a cover story for studying Torah. You may have heard that one yourself. But you have to ask the question, what was on the dreidel they were playing? <laughs> because it was before the miracle that they were getting oppressed for studying. So was it a great miracle will be there? <laughs> it's unclear. Now, a second strength of the book that was a strength of Sherwin's is a marvelous ability to synthesize a vast amount of information into a clear system. So for example, he points out that Jews in a multilingual setting will often choose the language of the dominant power to speak as their own home language. Home language. So when they were in Montreal, they often spoke English. When they were in Prague, they didn't speak Czech, they spoke German. When they were in North Africa, they didn't speak Berber, they spoke French. Or another example, he highlights the fact that the Amidah, the standing prayer, the so-called 18 benedictions, which is actually 19 because they added one later, but it's okay to still call it the 18 because if the Big Ten can have 12 teams in it and still be the Big Ten, um, it's the same principle. Now it's up, but even more, right? It'll be the Big 20 and then they'll split into Big Ten A and Big Ten B. Um, so he describes the uh, Amidah as a kind of rabbinic creed, and it, it points out in very simple language the fact that there is, in fact, a doctrine of traditional Judaism. It isn't the case that you're not supposed to believe anything. You believe whatever you want. It's not true. At the heart of the rabbinic prayer service was the rabbinic creed. The assertion that Orthodox Judaism had no creed is false. Both the Shema and the Amidah, the core elements of the morning and afternoon prayers, the evening prayers feature only the Amidah, present creedal statements disguised as praise. The first two blessings of the Amidah affirm the doctrines of inherited merit 
and the resurrection of the dead in the following way. Blessed are you, our God, the God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob. Blessed are you, our God, who revives the dead. These are statements of belief. The remaining blessings of the Amidah conclude in a similar way with creedal affirmations about the nature of God. He listens to prayer. He will bring his Messiah. He will restore the temple and his sacrificial services. If the recitation of these words was not required as an act of public conformity, then they would not be a creed. But they are. A wonderful demonstration of that principle in a very simple way. And third, he has a sometimes wicked sense of humor that I enjoy very much. And it comes through in the book as well. So for example, in discussing Baruch Spinoza, he describes how Enlightenment figures try to save the word God by redefining it. Spinoza was one attempt. The other attempt was called deism. A lot of our founding fathers are often uh, described as deist. Most Enlightenment philosophers were deists, as was Thomas Jefferson. Deists maintained the, that God created the world and established its laws of nature which govern it. Having done so, he retired, a deity emeritus, <laughs> and is unavailable to intervene to change anything that the order of the universe arranges. Prayer is useless. Talking to God is like talking to the wall. The behavioral consequences of deism, pantheism, and atheism are all the same, because you can't talk to anything that's not going to intervene. But describing the God of the Enlightenment as a deity emeritus is a wonderful tongue-in-cheek way to point out that he's, you know, he doesn't answer his calls anymore. He might show up once in a while, but generally has no responsibilities. Um, or the other example is when he's describing the encounter of the Jews with Persian culture, which had certain provocations to it. For example, the Persian style of burial. Most cultures feature either burial or cremation. But Persian culture, like Tibetan culture, ultimately preferred exposure to vultures. Bodies were simply left to be eaten in sacred places frequented by hungry birds of prey. The reason for this choice is lost in dim antiquity. But the Zoroastrian priests of the Persians offered a religious justification. They claimed that earth and fire were sacred and must not be defiled by the dead. Traditional Jews have a hard time dealing with cremation. You can just imagine how they must have responded to vultures. <laughs> Now, Schoen himself described his project at the introduction to the book. Over the last two centuries, a great deal of evidence has accumulated to create an alternative Jewish story. The origins of the Jewish people, the origins of the Bible, the evolution of priestly Judaism, and so on, all these chapters in Jewish history, which have been distorted by the lenses of mythology and apologetics, now have alternate stories. In some ways, the new alternatives are less romantic because the gods have been reduced to ideas in human minds and their passionate and whimsical agendas are absent from the tale. But in other ways, the new stories are more interesting and exciting because they are not merely the repetition of familiar religious doctrine. Flesh and blood people of the narrative are no longer the passive victims of divine manipulation, but rather the authors and creators of the events themselves. Sherman does not break new ground in archival research. He was not digging in the dirt with his hands to find new discoveries. What he did was he took what was known and he made it accessible. He made it interesting, and memorable, even inspiring. So I want to share with you a few examples of lessons from a provocative people. And then we'll open up for some questions and uh, comments. The first lesson is that what is Jewish about Judaism is the Jews. What ties together the animal sacrifice of Zadokite Judaism, the neo-Hellenistic philosophy of Maimonides, the pre-Torah polytheism of the first temple monarchy period where they had multiple gods in the temple in Jerusalem, the Jewish mystical school of Kabbalah, be it medieval Kabbalah or Madonna's Kabbalah, <laughs> and the Enlightenment-inflected rationalism of 19th century Reform Judaism. They don't have a shared theology. They don't have a shared ritual practice. They don't have a shared liturgy. They don't have a shared lifestyle. We as Jews have been everything from farmers and shepherds to warriors, to priests, to merchants, to urban intellectuals, to dot-com innovators. It may be the case that the Jews are more comfortable with shepherd ancestors like Abraham and Isaac than with craftsmen, merchants, and moneylenders. But shepherds have had very little to do with most of Jewish history, and merchants and money were omnipresent. It may be the case that the Jews as the precursors of capitalism in an urban society may be more important than the Jews as the inventors of a new theology. If we shift our focus then, the ancient period of Jewish history may turn out to be the prelude to more dramatic accomplishments. Modern times with all of its problematic anti-Semitism may in fact be the heyday of Jewish significance. 
What do all those ideologies, all those varieties of lifestyles and Judaisms have in common? It's not theology, it's their association with their creation by the Jewish people. Judaism did not appear from above and beyond. It came from us, from our experience, and it should serve us and our needs. Judaism has always evolved in response to new situations and outside influences. In fact, change is the Jewish tradition. A second lesson. You get a lot of new questions from a secular history of the Jews. When the rabbis were assembling the Tanakh, there are discussions recorded in the Talmud of what books would be in and what books would be out. And they had a series of criteria of what they would include them that tend to be theological. But it's worth asking the question, might there have been a political agenda too? After all, the rabbis did not include the books of Maccabees. At the time the Tanakh was being compiled, there was another Bible out there in Greek translation called the Septuagint. It became the basis for the Christian Old Testament, and it included two books that were most likely written by, or commissioned to be written by, the Maccabee kings. But the rabbis didn't like the Maccabees, because the Maccabees had said they were going to defend the pure worship of the Hebrew God, when in fact they themselves became Hellenized. They started out with great Jewish names like Yehuda, Matatyahu, then they became Hyrkanos, and Alexander, Ooh. <laughs> that was a bit uh, going to the dark side from their perspective. Um, and so they rejected the Maccabees entirely. There is no tractate of the Mishnah or Talmud on Hanukkah. The material is thrown in in the context of some blessings and the context of Shabbat because they figure, well, we're lighting candles, we'll throw in a, a paragraph about Hanukkah. And by the way, it's in the Talmud, not even in the Mishnah, that you first hear this story of the miracle of the lights. It's not in the books of Maccabees. It's not in Josephus, who lived a century after the Maccabees. They don't describe it at all. Why eight days? Because they were doing Sukkot late. They weren't able to do it in the hills, and Sukkot is seven days plus an atzeret, a closing day. It was eight days. Or you look back at the dedication of the first temple under Solomon, and he marked it as an eight-day festival. And so if they're rededicating, they make it an eight-day. But there's no miracle of the lights described anywhere. So why would the rabbis leave out the books of Maccabees and put in a miracle of the light story? Well, guess who's the hero now? You see, the hero now is not the Maccabee family. It's not the military victory. It is, in fact, the miracle that is the point of the holiday now. You've changed it. So those are the kind of questions you begin to ask when you begin to think about Jewish history as a secular history. We look for human motivations, natural causes for historical processes. It's a radically different reading from the biblical prophets. For example, did you know that today the vast majority of the world's Jews have been secularized over the past few centuries? Think of it this way. What percent of Jews light Hanukkah candles? Probably about 80%. What percent of Jews keep kosher? Maybe 15%, 20%, some do it in the house but not out. What percent of the world was what we would today call Orthodox 400 years ago? Basically everybody but Spinoza, right? 100% <laughs> minus one. What percent today are Orthodox? Again, maybe 15%, depending on the area, maybe 20%, obviously in certain neighborhoods or voting districts, it's a little bit higher concentration. But you understand that that's a secularization process to go from 100% minus one to 15% is a big change. And the world around us has become secularized too. You know, it was easy to believe the biblical version was automatically true when everyone else believed the biblical version was automatically true. It turns out that this documentary hypothesis, this belief that the Bible evolved over time, was compiled from many sources, it was often called higher criticism of the text, it has its roots in Spinoza, but it was really developed by Protestant thinkers. It's one of the reasons why, Sol why Solomon Schechter, one of the founding intellectual figures of American conservative Judaism, referred to higher criticism as higher anti-Semitism. And for many years they didn't want to teach it. But today, again, Reform rabbis, conservative rabbis, they all learned this documentary hypothesis for how the Bible and the Torah specifically came to be. It turns out that Jewish politics and Jewish economics can be more interesting than theology. After all, religion is just one aspect of a full picture of Jewish identity. So you have attention paid here to Jewish socialism, to the anti-traditionalism of the Zionist movement, the positives of acculturation to the surrounding society, the contributions of the Jews to world culture, and even perhaps our status as a model of globalization. You see, the Jewish experience might in fact be the future of the world. 
In feudal Europe, they were living a commercial lifestyle. They were in business when you should have been either a landlord or a serf. They weren't allowed to be landlords, and who wants to be a serf? Instead, they had a diaspora experience among immobile populations. They were mobile, but they kept their own identity. Think about American businessmen living in China for 20 years, or Chinese people coming here for college and staying. What does it mean to be a citizen of more than one place, to have an identity that's not where you're from? That was the Jewish experience for centuries. They're looking forward in a way that other people weren't. Very early in their history, he writes at the very end of the book, the Jews tasted the possibility of becoming a world people. This development may be their most enduring contribution to the world. Many historians will still maintain that monotheism and compassionate ethics were the major contributions of the Jews. But monotheism is an increasingly problematic ideology in a secular world. And philosophic monotheism has its roots in many cultures. As for compassionate ethics, it is neither ethical nor empirically responsible for any nation to designate itself as the inventor of ethics. Given their history and influence, the Jews have been and remain a provocative and extraordinary people, the unwitting precursors of a global world that they helped to invent. You see, the truth is, if you look at it from a secular point of view, the greatest time in Jewish history is now. There's no nostalgia in this book for the glory days of Abraham or for the wisdom of Solomon, who most likely was illiterate because only the priests knew how to write in those days. You see, it's crucial to understand and evaluate the past with a clear perspective, from our own perspective. Animal sacrifice is barbaric and primitive. Parochial chauvinism is a core element of biblical and early rabbinic literature and belief, and so on. As Sherman writes, again in his epilogue, the greatest era of Jewish life is the present. Despite the Holocaust, never before have the Jews individually and collectively possessed more wealth, more power, and more influence. We don't like to say that out loud, but it may be true. The global economy, which the Jews helped to pioneer, now embraces the planet. The realm of science, in which the Jews have excelled far beyond their numbers, has now replaced religious faith as the dominant source of intellectual power in the countries that possess military and economic strength. The legacy of Jewish Nobel Prize winners outshines the prophets and sages of the religious past. It is science that now has the power to transform human existence. None of the insights of the biblical past have cured disease, have lengthened life, have triggered a dynamic economy, or forged the technology to unite humanity. In fact, the hardcore of religious fundamentalists who hate the modern world and the world of science derive their inspiration from the, quote, wisdom of that era. The emerging global culture, which rests on the achievements of science, has dramatically raised the standard of living for over one half of the people on our planet. Most of the readers of this book would not be alive to read any book without the successes and special contributions of Jewish medical scientists. And the last lesson of this book is that studying Jewish history is Jewish practice. Doing Jewish is not just deepening your Jewish identity by reciting prayers or studying Torah. Learning where our people came from, how they came to be what they are today, whom they may become in the future, that is the study of Jewish history, and that is an expression of a deep Judaism. The meaning of the Jewish experience to each of us and to all of us is the subject of this book and also a core concern of humanistic Judaism. Sherman Wein did not invent the facts of Jewish history. He read, he synthesized, he understood the sweep of the Jewish experience, and he drew some lessons from it, lessons about what happened and why, what may yet happen and what can happen if we will it to be so. But now it's up to us. And this is his last gift, this sharing of knowledge. For all of his creativity and independent thinking, Sherman was in many ways a consummate rabbi. And if rabbi means teacher, then that work continues. <laughs>